we have before we're live? We're, we're live now. Do we need to grab a coffee or something? No, no, I just need to grab a call, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be here. Excellent. Um, what do you reckon, Christina? Do you want to get, get underway? Um, I reckon, yeah, we kick off. Welcome, everybody, for the second Rocketeers of Retail webinar. We're really happy to see you here. Um, today, we'll be discussing what it means to take your physical business 100% um, into the digital realm. So our team of panelists will be talking about their experience transitioning into this space. We'll be taking questions um, throughout the conversation, so feel free to either shoot them through the, into the Q&A section or into the chat. We'll field them as we can. There are 10 minutes dedicated at the end of this call to answer your questions specifically. Um, we'll be posting a link through to our Rocketeers of Retail Slack channel where we will engage in further conversation across with other merchants and retailers who have been participating with us over the last few weeks. Um, we will also be sending through a follow-up email after this, um, after this panel with a recording. So you will be able to review everything we've discussed and hold on to that for record. I'll pass on to Wadey to introduce our panelists and our co-host and we'll kick it off. Over to you, Wadey. G'day guys. Um, yeah, my name is Andrew, Andrew Waite. I'm the Managing Director of Convert Digital. Uh, for those of you who don't know the Rocketeers, uh, myself and, and Rob, who unfortunately can't be with us uh, today um, from, from Ship It, set up the Rocketeers back in 2017, uh, predominantly to hear, hear stories from SMB and, um, and retailers that are really trying to, um, uh, you know, grow in this economy and, and, and grow in the market. But um, <coughs> the, the purpose of today and the while, while we're looking to run these series of online sessions is to hear stories from those who are impacted by what's going on in the, the market at the moment. So today we're fortunate to have Rachel from Forever New, Phil from Milligram, and Merlene from Practicology. I'll pass some of those guys to do a brief introduction and then we'll get underway. Ready, who do you want to go first? Let's go with you, Rachel. Okay. Uh, my name is Rachel Siegel, and I'm currently head of digital and e-commerce at Forever New. For those who don't know what Forever New is, and that's probably more of the men on the call, it's, uh, it's one of Australia's leading fashion brands in terms of evening, winter, and casual wear. Um, and I currently lead the customer experience in the group. So we are quite a large team of agile marketers and digital transformationists who basically look at what is the best experience for a customer and how do we achieve it? And then we work with our IT and digital teams to make sure that that happens. So uh, in the last year, we've released about four first to uh, market experiences and they've been really successful. So we, we hope to make the most of this time and really be able to pivot as a business and use that agility to our strengths. Over to you, Merlin. Thank you. I'm Merlin McGregor, General Manager of Practicology. I started the um, Australian Arm of Practicology um, almost seven years ago, and we are a team of um, 30 multi-channel um, experts who all work across um, a different range of retailers um, in relation to best practice, e-commerce strategy and execution. And we also um, work with a lot of clients um, in helping um, accelerate their um, digital revenue and sales. Fantastic, and Phil? Yep, so my name's Phil. I'm the digital manager for Telegram Co. Um, so we wholesale and distribute a number of international brands and also run Milligram, which is our retail chain, which is both physical retail and online. Um, yeah, and I look after all of our e-commerce, digital marketing and online tools. Excellent. And um, yeah, as I mentioned at the start, unfortunately, Rob isn't able to facilitate with myself today. So Rob's from, from Shipper, for those of you who don't know. Uh, but we're fortunate enough to have Tristan Miller from uh, Shopify, Shopify Plus. And uh, say good day, Tristan, and let's get this thing underway. Thanks, Wadey. Thanks. Uh, it's an honor to be here. Uh, I was listening in last week and really enjoyed it. And uh, it's a hard act to follow Rob uh, asking the questions, but I'll give it a go anyway. Uh, I'm the uh, APAC uh, part manager uh, with a couple of my counterparts, obviously, across you know, APAC. And, uh, and obviously, we've seen a lot of change as well at Shopify. It's really exciting to have uh, our merchants on the, on the call here and a whole lot of listeners 
Um, we know it's a really difficult time, but we're really, really excited to talk about what people are doing to kind of shift their businesses into uh, into this new world. So uh, we'll start off, uh, we've got a few questions uh, set, and I know we're gonna sort of wax lyrical a little later and have a few questions um, brought in by the audience. But, uh, but first off, I have a, a question uh, for you, Rachel. It's, uh, is uh, what does going virtual mean in this, uh, in uh, for traditional retailers? How are you kind of adapting and seeing a bit of change within your business immediately? Um, look, I think that oh, we are in a really fortunate position in that we have really invested in online in the last few years, and we have gone quite significantly global with our platform. So we do have that flexibility in the business already. I would say from a virtual perspective at the moment, where probably the most agility and opportunity lies for all businesses at the moment are probably in the small to medium enterprise level um, because there is so many more opportunities to pivot. So, and to bring services and, and products online that previously weren't. So, for example, we're looking at new ways to do click and collect in a safe way and new ways to do returns and, and finding ways that you can basically offer a service that you didn't before. So, you know, at the moment we're using our social channels to do in-home try-ons where we've got our staff, our, our, our really, you know, our brand advocates to try on outfits and basically show customers new product that they're no longer getting the opportunity to do in real life. And that's been super positive for our business and, and being able to have conversations we otherwise potentially wouldn't have. And, and that in itself uh, creates a lot of content, doesn't it? And all mm -hmm. of this other stuff to feed on itself. Has that been really helpful? Has that been a bit unexpected? Um, it's been... I mean, I, I use this word a lot and I know you should probably start a drinking game on it, but it's been completely unprecedented what this event would do to our industry, an industry that was booming, that was on the way up. You know, you look at your roadmap and there was literally the sky was the limit. So I think in some ways, the agility and innovation that is going to come out of this period is probably more substantial than anything we could have done on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and so I think when it comes to content, that is also the case. So things that otherwise wouldn't have been at the forefront of what you would have been doing are now the number one choice. So things like being really one-to-one -one on customers, you know, having conversations in public forums like social media and, and then also, you know, social media platforms like TikTok um, are now taking off to the point where, you know, I'm old and I think it's cool now and I thought it was just for teenagers. And so I think what will evolve out of this is that you... You know, everyone was first doing it for the gram, but now it's for the top. And so content becomes shorter, more agile. In some ways, the whole content strategy that you had yesterday no longer exists. So I think that's probably where there's been this huge shift in a very short amount of time to change the way people wish to be communicated to. That, uh, that Andrew, Andrew, Catherine, ScoMo video, I've just been loving oh, it. Oh, it's just the best. Uh, I think I'm going to create a ringtone out of it. But uh, moving on, uh, Merlina, question for you. Which industries uh, and companies have adapted the best to moving their operations online? And, uh, you know, conversely, who, has, who do you think are, are not dealing with it very well right now? I guess, obviously, there's the, uh, the travel industry, et cetera, doesn't quite know what to do at all right now. But uh, some, some businesses are moving well. What, what are you saying? Um... Yeah, I think Athleisure has done a really good job in terms of pivoting to online. I think some of those brand aggregators and even just single brands. I mean, we've seen the um, news and the data that's been coming out of, I think, Nike globally. I think they've done a really good job in basically leveraging um, their brand power and directing customers to um, their online channels instead of um, stores. So I think the big players will continue to um, see their online stores grow um, exponentially over the next through, uh, the next few months. Um, children's wear and baby wear also seems to have um, picked up incredibly well um, in terms of purchasing online, probably because a lot of busy mums are already used to buying online. So it's a relatively um, easy pivot rather than having to get out of the house is um, doing that shop online. I think um, this, the, the verticals that have really struggled, but where we've seen some of the... Um, where we've seen some of the biggest innovation as well is um, I think restaurants, obviously. We 
have quite a few restaurant clients and they have really, um, and events-based clients, and they have really struggled during this time for obvious reasons. But when we've seen some really interesting innovation pieces come out, like, you know, pub venues being turned into um, grocery venues and restaurateurs pivoting to, um, instead of welcoming, uh, you know, customers to their to their restaurants. They're um, also able to um, upload their recipes and provide a lot of content, and also do almost like ready-made meals for date night and that sort of thing, and do pairings with wine. So, um, I think there is definitely um, some innovation that we're going to see in the food space come out of um, what is otherwise quite an unprecedented disaster um, for almost everybody. Um, I think one industry that is really going to um, struggle to pivot is probably B2B during this time. And I think they're certainly not lacking revenue, but what they are lacking is I think the, um, the influx of orders and I think the volume. And they generally have very large and heavy systems that are very quite difficult to move. It's like moving a very slow moving kind of warship. So I think that will also spark I think a wave of um, B2B um, and e-commerce um, probably projects and strategy reviews post this period. Yeah, we're seeing um, from our end, sorry, Tristan to jump in there, but um, yeah, a number of our merchants uh, uh, who certainly are B2B are moving to DDC strategies uh, almost immediately. Like we're having conversations with with uh, a number of people there. Phil, do you have anything to add with, with your business and, and how you guys are looking to restructure? Um, so for us, I guess our focus has shifted primarily to online. Um, it's not really a new area for us. Um, so we were, I guess, 10 years online only before we moved into physical retail. Um, the biggest shift for us is, I guess, how we've operated. So we basically in the last month have overhauled our, our complete marketing strategy, buying strategy. Um, yeah. And just, but where we're focusing our business. Um, so it's been a huge effort from our team to really just completely pivot our biz business model. Um, Another, um, I guess, sort of an, an add on to that uh, for you, Merlin, is what areas have your clients kind of struggled to translate like uh, to the online space? Are there areas I mean, I, I think it's been fascinating to see, you know, I thought the alcohol industry was booming online and then all of a sudden all these um, kind of, you know, whiskey, whiskey makers, et cetera, are making hand sanitizer. Are you, um, are you, <laughs> both yeah. equally, both equally necessary, I think, during these times. Um, I don't want them to entirely pivot, to be honest with you. Um, Four Pillars Gin has actually just brought out a hand sanitizer, which um, I'm quite eager to purchase for Various curious their reasons. They, they set it on their website yesterday. They had too many yeah. orders and it destroyed their site. Oh, <laughs> right. They broke the internet, so that's amazing. Um, oh, look, it's the old and it's not, I think the biggest issue that I've seen with a lot of our fashion clients um, is size charts and sizing, that good old fashioned um, issue of sizing charts. And I don't think it's anything that is new, I think, to... The situation that we're faced with now but I think it has been exacerbated because there really isn't any way to go in store and and try trying your fit so I think um what Rachel was talking about before in terms of getting really innovative um and using social media to uh upload or to try and close in different um um with different sizes and doing one-on-one -on -one consultations We'll actually see, I think, retailers um, and brands um, get a lot closer to their customers during this time. But for us, definitely sizing charts continues to be um, an ongoing issue with our clients. And how does that kind of work when it comes to returns policies? I mean, if you're in a business and you're getting returns and you can't handle them or manage them in some way, is that problematic? Um, maybe that's a question for you, Rachel. I don't know. So I would say returns are probably my uh, closest enemy. Um, so returns are a really tricky one. I think customer expectation has come a really long way in terms of how quickly can I get rid of the clothes I don't want. I think there's been definitely a shift towards consumption watch um, from an ethical standpoint, but also just from a risk point of view, you know, there are big retailers who run at a loss who offer customers free returns. 
And that's a really tough choice for a business that is running on a profitable model who doesn't have, you know, um, you know, investment in the same shape or form that someone like the Iconic or ASOS has, which is a fantastic customer experience, of course. So I think from a returns perspective, it's about minimising someone needing to return something. So we have a fit tool called TrueFit, um, which allows you to basically use uh, AI technology to basically size up your wardrobe. So something that fits you in a brand A, plug it into the system, what size will you be at Forever New? And that's been extremely successful for us and has had extremely uh, incremental results. Um, but I think from a returns perspective, it's about how do you offer the customer uh, experience like free returns, which is a convenience economy, without necessarily costing the bottom line. Um, and that's something we're constantly working towards at Forever New. Um, and that's that the convenience economy is something that someone will pay for as long as it makes their life easier. And that's how we look at returns. Amazing. Uh, and another question here, uh, I think it's a, still a good one for you, Merlene, but maybe Phil as well. Uh, how have uh, you or your, you know, in your case, your clients, Merlene, uh, had to adapt their technology stack in this current situation? Um, a lot of our clients for the first time are using um, instant messenger platforms like Slack. Um, with our clients, we have a, um, an open Slack channel with each of our clients, um, which allows us to have, I think, more timely communication with them, um, which has worked really, really well. And I think also getting their head around um, video technology, not all of them, but some of them, some of the more old school um, clients have, I think, really um, struggled to adapt quickly, but are, are now enjoying, I think, every meeting being, you know, a video meeting as opposed to just having a phone call. So I think um, for our clients, it's been very much as well a struggle with some of our clients who are still working from their HQ because their servers are locked down and they can't actually access any of their information outside of, um, outside of the building. And we've seen that that's been... Um, that's been a big driver, a big focus for a lot of our clients where um, they literally actually can't do work from home. That's difficult. Phil, have you had any major changes in your business? I mean, I guess you're going to or you have seen an increase in online orders. Is that putting pressure on your fulfilment network, et cetera? Um, so for us, it hasn't had a lot of impact on our tech stack. Um, so for us, we're largely cloud-based to start with. So the biggest change, I guess, in terms of us internally, um, since we've moved to work remotely, has just been the internal communication tools. Um, so now, rather than all being in the same office, we're using Zoom for a virtual office. Um, we have done a lot of work on our tech stack and are still evolving at the moment. So our e-com currently is still running on an M1 site, um, which is in the process of being moved to a Shopify Plus site, um, <laughs> yeah, which is a combination of Shopify Plus and Convert Digital. Um, but yeah, so I guess we've been sort of in the middle of upgrading all of our tech for online before all this started. Um, so I guess we're just pushing more to and continuing towards that. Um, but yeah, I guess we were already fairly well set up to work remotely. Um, so yeah, there hasn't really been a great impact for um, myself, for example, I could work remotely anyway. Um, it's just now how we actually do that as a whole company rather than just one or the one off person who's working remotely. Fair enough. Wadey, do you have anything to add to that? Because you would have seen from your clients requesting from various variations in their tech stack, et cetera, they're going to come to you first, I imagine. Yeah, I think from our standpoint, we're seeing um, merchants uh, wanting innovation um, in every possible capacity. So they're going, okay, well, what can we do? What can we do now? Um, who can we talk to? Um, we're certainly seeing from our, our tech partners, um, you know, there's a, a fair few offers that are coming out with those partners on um, you know, really quick turnaround with onboarding, um, as well as, you know, uh, things like um, yeah, discounts on subscriptions or um, I think even Shopify have released that, you know, three months for, for free to sign up um, for the, the, the new merchant. So, um, yeah, I, I think certainly encourage people to go out and, and talk to those partners if you're not using things like Zendesk or, um, 
some customer service management tools and now is the time to be onboarding us. It's interesting. We've definitely, um, you know, created a lot of extra conversation for ourselves by opening up the, uh, the, you know, any of our plans to a 90 day trial, except for Shopify Plus, which is a different yeah. kind of beast for us. Um, but, uh, but definitely we're finding that all of our partners are doing something similar. Um, other vendors, uh, you know, they just, it's a, now's a good time to be trialing some of those tools for not just, you know, um, efficiency within your business, but automation, et cetera. So, yeah, it's pretty exciting to see that. Um, uh, Rachel, how has the, uh, the UX CX played a role uh, in making decisions about how you pivot your op operation online? And you, you kind of spoke a little bit about that mm. already, I think. Um, look, I think at the moment, our user experience tech stack is quite significant. Um, we have done a lot of investment in our online platforms over the last year. So I think for us, it's about how do we get the most out of what we're doing at the moment. Um, so we look use, at user experience holistically. So that's everything from the first touch point the customer has in advertising all the way through to customer service um, on returns, refunds and order in, um, inquiries. Um, so what we really have done uh, in order to pivot for this, this unprecedented event is to ramp up what we're doing with live chat. So we use a platform called Inside Chat. It's really fun if you guys have never really been on it. They're like little avatars and they walk around your little virtual store and you can chat to them and they have little like emotions and sunglasses. Um, and so <laughs> it's very cute. Um, and so we are using our current staff who are part of our e-commerce customer experience team to actually train those live chat staff in becoming online sales agents. So monitoring them, making sure they're telling the customer the right information, going above and beyond, you know, calling us with ideas that they've had from customers, like really using a close feedback loop to understand what customers are doing at the moment, what they're expecting and how do we create better experiences for them. And I think from that perspective, that has really changed how we're able to talk to our customers in a really one-to-one -one way. And then also what we have seen is a major uplift in social traffic. So whereas customers are not that interested at the moment in going and physically searching in, you know, pants, dresses, things like that. If we look at Google Trends, you know, it's, it's pretty much seen about an 80% decline. But we are seeing the uplift in what's been completely unprecedented is people are being drawn in by a more educational message across social media channels. So where they used to just be browsing and now people have more time to browse than ever, they're stumbling upon products and brands that they otherwise never would have the opportunity to find or that have ignored in the the cycle that is a really busy schedule so we are seeing real shifts towards the social channels of things whereas we wouldn't have seen them before so that's been a really big shift in our user experience and at which touch points we can now talk to our customers so i think at this time the more you can talk to your customers and the more you can create one-on-one -on -one relationships the more likely you are to retain them in a time where people really feel uneasy about spending money on things that they don't necessarily believe in and, and that raises a question. I mean, we've got this listed here as well as how you're redeploying staff that aren't able to be used in other areas such as your retail stores, et cetera. Are they helping you with the, have you found that you're able to retrain a few of those staff members to do any of these sorts of roles to resource you a little bit better in that space? I think within our business, we've definitely all put on just some different hats. Um, and, you know, we've got things like, um, you know, we'll reply to social at different times of the day at the moment, or, you know, we will use some of our staff to do training with other staff to make sure that we're upskilling across the team. I think in times like this, agility is the number one thing businesses need to adopt. Um, because if they don't, everyone will fall behind. If everyone sort of sits in their box, it, we can't come together and create an online experience is going to be worthwhile for the customer. So that's sort of how we're looking at it at the moment internally. Fair enough. And, and this is a little bit preloaded, but Phil, I know that you were redeploying some of your staff. Like how, how is that looking for you right now? Yeah. So we've recently, um, well, as of this week, closed our physical retail stores. So we're looking to redeploy our retail store staff in our warehouse, um, potentially customer service, um, I've got people like our visual merchandising team have come across to help do visual merchandising on our website. So they're doing big reviews through categories and products and making sure that the rel that relevant information is there and the right opportunities are being used. Um, 
basically treating the online store like they would a physical store. Um, so yeah, we're really trying to find who has some skills that can we can, I guess, repurpose for the digital channel rather than you know having the physical store presence. Fair enough, and and, and we had actually spoken to it before, about it a little bit before the call, but you know with the um, with the government trying to step in and sort of add the you know the, the job subsidy kind of uh, allowance etc. It's a bit of an unknown quantity as to how that's going to affect everyone's businesses. Uh, are there any thoughts about that, Malene? Do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I think in terms of the government stimuluses. Um, I think they've been really welcomed and really positive. I think some really big players in the retail industry have come out and that's basically um, shown their support, I think, for the recent government stimulus. I've been trying to track it. We do um, like a, a daily, weekly, monthly kind of sales tracker in terms of e-commerce sales. And I've been looking at um, how each announcement has enhanced or really contributed to, um, I think, the uptick in e-commerce sales. It's been a little bit difficult, however, obviously, because they've also been combined with, you know, stores closing at the same time and that sort of thing. But in general, I think the stimulus packages are very welcomed by um, the retail community. There's a number out at both a federal and a state level. At the federal level, there's obviously the job seeker and job keeper um, stimulus packages or subsidy packages. And at a state level, there's a number of different subsidies, including um, either a rebate or a future relaxation on payroll tax, which is um, a big I say burden, but it's a, a big cost and expense to businesses every um, every month. So I think obviously lots of lots of CFOs and COOs and CEOs are talking to business owners, are talking to their accounting firms right now, and um, asking what that actually um, means for them. I think in relation to the um, job keeper, I know especially that has given a lot of both um, retailers, brands, and even partners and suppliers alike some confidence that they can um, continue from a business continuity perspective, keep their doors open, but also continue to support their partners and su support their clients during this this particular point in time as well. So it, it looks like it's been quite well received. I've just been looking at March numbers and um, I think revenue is up. 60% year on year and I've just looked at um, even just to start to April at the moment and e-commerce sales are up with our cohort of retailers um, is up 120% year on year. So obviously a lot of the, um, a lot of that will be from, uh, I, I think brands that have closed their store networks that are now migrating to online. And obviously, some uh, businesses are not doing well in this uh, scenario, and uh, you know, they're, they're, they're struggling through it in one fashion or another. But some businesses are being overwhelmed by extra traffic, and uh, and uh, both, so, you know, in some circumstances, in store, and probably it's more the grocery network, but also others are being overwhelmed online. That, that's not always a good thing. What kind of impacts are you seeing for some of those businesses that weren't quite ready? Yeah, I think we saw that. And that can happen at every level, I think. You know, it can happen with the really big guys. You look at what happened with um, Woolworths and Brad Banducci coming out and having to apologise because I think they they tried to implement some really, um, I guess, socially responsible strategies around, you know, I think seeing as hour um, from 7am or 8am and they weren't quite set up operationally to be able to do that in a really seamless manner. And it's the same for, I think, retailers or clients or, you know, e-commerce businesses that aren't quite set up for success from a customer experience point of view, people having trouble either checking out or stock net levels not being accurate. And it really, in, in this time where um, I think every sale is even more important than ever before um, and people just can't go into store, you know, online is their only channel, I think, to purchase it's just more important than ever before to really satisfy that customer experience and be able to audit your own customer experience um, very quickly. And as Rachel used the term, with agility and really identify, I think, what those barriers to purchase are to um, be able to meet those customer expectations. 
And uh, Wadey, have you seen any, do you have anything to add to that? Have you seen any changes for some of your merchants that are struggling in this unprecedented, uh, sometimes overwhelming? I think, um, yeah, the overwhelming thing is yeah, we have merchants who, um, you know, in, in gym equipment who are in um, health and health and beauty and wellness, um, certainly uh, been able to change messaging online immediately and ensuring that we've got um, accuracy in stock levels. Some businesses are just pausing online sales to um, do a bit of a recount depending on um, if they've got the ability to do that, obviously. So uh, having that open communication with customers, I think is, is critical. And as Rachel sort of said, the more you can communicate right now, the better. Um, so certainly um, we're, we're posting a few different uh, discussion points and links to how people can use some of these tools. So we'll continue to keep that chat going on in, in the, the Slack um, Slack group. But um, one of the questions I've got that sort of talks about some of those retailers that are struggling to, to move on to your point, Tristan, is that some of our merchants that are struggling looking at their product mix and how they can either you know redeploy um, existing supply chains or existing manufacturing methods to create new products so that might be you know if you're in party supplies or how can you look at in-home activities for kids um, you know given that obviously everyone's uh, in in that situation at the moment um, yeah maybe Phil um, you guys are in stationary and um, uh, have you guys seen any change in your demand and, and what people are purchasing and are you looking at in introducing new products yeah so I guess we as a business sort of shifted very quickly to focus a bit more on uh, one of our other verticals which is basically wellness um, so we um, have brought in a lot of new brands as well as sort of uh, bolstered the ranges in some of our um, existing brands. Um, so, for example, one thing which we weren't selling a month ago, which is in one of our top categories at the moment, is jigsaw puzzles. Mm. Um, <laughs> just, yeah, and like our focus has been, you know, what you can do at home to stay sane. Um, part of that is sort of where our customer demand is part of that is what stock we're able to actually get to sell at the moment because um, we work with brands from all over the world and we had issues getting stock out of china now we're getting issue having issues getting stock out of europe um, and also then the cost of that as well with the dollar and freight charges going up because of you know change there's less commercial flights so air freight costs a lot more um, so we've really sort of shifted our focus. We've been working a lot more with local brands and also looking to develop some new products with some of our local suppliers that we already have had pre-existing relationships with. Um, so for us, yeah, it's been a real sort of shift. Um, of, yeah, we, I guess it, it's a shift we were making already um, yeah. and you've probably seen it with our new site, new website if you've had a look at it um yeah. yeah really changed the way we're approaching product um as a business um and i guess this has really accelerated that for us what about um you guys rachel what's selling what's not uh, well, I told you I had to kill you, um, but um, <laughs> I, do, I do think fashion has had to pivot in a big way. I think that yeah. the first thing to go probably is, you know, I don't really need a new dress. Um, you know, our, our spouses married us anyway, so dressing up has really gone out the door. Um, I am going to put hands on the bottom of this all right now, um, but I think... I think for brands, and this is probably um, not from a forever new perspective, but probably from a small and medium enterprise level, where I've seen probably the best pivoting in the market is where brands have really come out of the woodwork to create um, really great virtual experiences and potentially find a bit of an upside in their holistic customer experience. So I think, you know, if brands are going to completely pivot online, it becomes less about online and more about your business, right? So I think at the moment, you know, people need to find new ways to find, I guess, brand extension without necessarily costing the bottom line. And, you know, we are all in this boat together. So I think, especially in Australia, especially with this, you know, mentality that people really want to help each other, private label should be seeing a spike right now. Um, especially people do have their own manufacturing arms to be able to help out other people in the industry to create brand extension. So 
for instance, I've been doing my uh, hot Pilates in my living room and just turning up the heater. Um, but, you know, things like uh, at-home equipment gear to be able to achieve the same experience you would in your, your normal, I um, can get in my car and go anywhere lifestyle. Those, side of, those kind of product extensions can be really profitable for companies as people want to be able to still live their lives um, from the comfort of their own homes. So I think that's where brands are pivoting to. And it's definitely something that Forever New is looking to drive in a convenience economy to create that I can get in my car and go anywhere experience within the home. Fantastic. Very convoluted answer. <laughs> All right. Good. Uh, and, and so as far as physical stores are, are concerned, I mean, um, I'm not sure, sorry, Rachel, if, uh, if all your stores are, are closed or some, but, um, but you, you mentioned click and collect, et cetera. Like, is that still something that you can enable right now? Like, you can facilitate that? Um, so I think click and collect is something that we definitely look at as a business as a whole. I think at the moment, from a click and collect perspective, Again, small and medium enterprise businesses who are traditional have the leg up on click and collect um, because they're currently sitting on basically VCs that they can now use for online fulfillment. So the way that you know restaurants are doing deliveries, more small to enterprise businesses who do have brick and mortar now have an opportunity to basically turn their their stores into a valet or a DC. Um, and so I think that that's really exciting part of all this is how do you start to use rent reductions and mortgage relief to start to create more um, online based experiences while still being able to use your stores and not just letting them sit there um, and also have access to that stock you previously wouldn't have. Uh, I guess, Phil, in your circumstances, is that something you've been exploring? Is uh, you've obviously moving your staff, you know, in, in different directions. Like, can you explore more of that space? Um, we have sort of looked at it a little bit. Um, we've taken a little bit of a different approach. Um, we don't, we've only have the four stores and they're all based in Melbourne. So we've taken the approach of we've pulled most of the inventory from those stores and moved it back to the warehouse. So we're still using our centralized DC in Melbourne. Um, and it, for us, it's just a matter of efficiency. We don't have the packing materials, the stores aren't set up to ship. So for us, we've moved the inventory to where we can ship rather than trying to overhaul the retail spaces. Um, and all of our stores, or well, most of our stores are in centers. And with those centers, most some of those are starting to close. So really the option of having people in there fulfilling orders is just not there anymore. Fair enough. Um, and uh, any other tips that you might have with uh, merchants that are changing their operations, you know, in the physical stores, any other things that either you, Rachel, or you feel have seen that would you would recommend? Mm. I might uh, just have a bit of a discussion around just as far as marketing allocation. We talked about it a little bit last week, but um, Rachel, we, we haven't talked about it at, at all today. What are you guys doing as far as marketing is concerned? Any shift in channels? Any more focus on social uh, things more expensive for you guys? The, the cost per click has gone up, gone down. What are you seeing? Um, I think we've definitely seen a shift into social channels. I think that's definitely where people are spending their most time at the moment. It is a very easy distraction when you are working at home. I think we can all say that we're pretty guilty of that. Um, so I think there has been a major shift in where people are willing to look for product. Uh, there's definitely been a global decline in overall product search. However, I did look at the buy online and delivery um, search volumes for the last few months, and they've been an almost 100% growth for the last few weeks. So I think people are definitely looking at new ways to have things delivered or have an outside experience in the home. So actually when it comes to cost per click and things like that, things have stayed relatively normal. Remembering that Google and Facebook, they play in your own field. So although some fields like, you know, travel, uh, in some cases, a lot of, um, you know, extracurricular activities are seeing a downfall, that doesn't necessarily affect the retail industry as much because we are all playing in the same space. Um, and I think it's just about at the moment really picking things apart. And that's sort of my aim of the next few months is where do we spend the most money to get the best return on investment? 
and how do we start using our data better to achieve that? So looking at things like who's more likely to purchase with us from a loyalty perspective, who's more likely to purchase a certain product from us, can we create tailored journeys on that using the tech stack we already have? Um, I think when it comes to advertising at the moment, data is the most valuable key that we have. Um, and everyone knows that data appreciates in value. And if there's ever a time to reallocate staff or redeploy staff, it's to find the answers in the data um, and potentially invest in a consultant at this time to really get your, or, or even platforms like Amasis, Clavio, Dotmailer, mm. all of those platforms will allow you to actually pick out your most profitable customers. And that is where to spend money at the time and create tailored promotions for those customers so you don't hurt your brand in the long run. And I imagine previously you would have done that, like your analysis on that on a month to month basis. Is it now kind of weekly? You're looking at the data weekly or fortnightly? I mean, when you make an adjustment, you want to see an outcome after, over a period of time. Do you, are you trying to make faster decisions around that based on the extra volume of online traffic or are you kind of still making decisions and letting it play out a little bit before you jump to the next one? Um, look, I'm an extremely impatient person, so I'd probably go with the former. Um, we are just testing everything at the moment. So we're using, you know, platforms like Insider that has an A-B testing arm to actually look at full journeys, which we probably could have done more with um, in the past. Um, and really looking at, you know, if we are going to test a segment or we are going to find a profitable customer, how do we use them? You know, not everything has to be used across every channel. How do we actually use what we're seeing in our data to the, the highest return on investment? Um, so that's, that's probably what we're doing more of now is can we start using these in a different way and, and what were our results? Um, I think based on the traffic that customers are getting in the moment, it's definitely worth capitalising on it from a data testing perspective. I think, I, think, I think I want to come back to the loyalty of email stuff, but just uh, sticking with the same topic around um, you know, marketing. Marilyn, this is your bread and butter. Um, you guys deal with this on a day by day basis. What's uh, what are you guys seeing with with your clients and some of the decision making around marketing spend? Yeah, it's certainly been um, a it certainly had an increased focus over the last um, few months and certainly ramped up in the last um, few weeks. With a lot of um, with a lot of clients, what we're doing is we're actually setting basically daily targets and understanding what we need to hit from a channel perspective to keep the lights on and keep the business going, I think, during this um, difficult time. So doing a full channel split and doing a channel mix and actually having a target by channel, what you need those channels to do over this time. And I think that's really important for any brand to um, be able to drive, I think, their online channels even harder. Um, we are recommending for a lot of our clients that they need to ro relax their ROS or ROI targets during this time. It's really a market share game. So also just being able to um, relax those targets so you can go um, wider and start to build audiences. I mean, this is unprecedented in terms of the amount of traffic that is online at the moment. And it is the perfect time to build um, audiences, especially audiences of customers that might never have shopped online um, before. But certainly customer behaviour will change out of... Um, out of um, the, the events, the unfolding events. So um, I think it's been well documented. I mean, the rise of JD.com in China was really um, born out of the SARS epidemic that happened in China. I think it was 17 or 18 years ago. Um, Tmall was already, um, I think Alibaba was already present, but um, JD.com really, um, you know, I think in the rise of online and marketplace shopping also took off during the, um, the SARS outbreak. Um, way back when so with clients we're doing a lot of channel planning we're looking at key metrics we're making sure that the google analytics is set up for success and it's really robust and it's tracking what the customer of what our clients need it to track and then we're going all the way down into as rachel said full funny journey mapping um understanding what it takes to um, acquire a customer and have a returning customer and then also utilising um, existing databases and washing them against, you know, um, Google, washing them against paid search, search, washing them against social media, um, prospecting and targeting as well. So you're actually getting more bang for buck out of the database and out of the assets that you already have. So um, they're just a few things. Also, it's a, a great time to um, open up a new channel, like I think affiliates, a lot of brands don't use affiliates strategically. Um, so that's a really good opportunity to potentially open up a new revenue driving channel. 
and also looking at um, different technologies that can also aid, I think, any um, performance media spend or organic um, organic um, strategies like utilising a ratings and reviews platform like a, um, a FIFA or Trustpilot even. So, you know, because that's been known to increase, I think, click-through and conversion rates. So um, having um, online reviews. So they're just a few things that our um, that we're working with with our clients to make sure that we maximise that online revenue. And even some of our clients have doubled their media budgets. If, and if you can, um, that's a great place to be, but obviously with ROI and MOAS targets in place. Absolutely. Um, so just to segue into and um, looping back to what you were mentioning around loyalty and, and email a bit there, Rachel, um, any change to loyalty strategy? I know I've seen people do things like, you know, doubling of uh, loyalty points um, and that sort of stuff um, uh, in this market as well as email communication and, and what you are uh, starting to push out to customers. Are you seeing more communication? You don't want to flood the market with too much um, What's, uh, any thoughts or insights there? Um, look, I think this is where the people side of things really comes into play. I think aggression in this market has to be balanced with how everyone's feeling. This is an extremely difficult period for everyone. There isn't anyone who hasn't been touched by what's going on in the market at the moment. So I think brands have to play a really fine line between over communicating and having genuine conversations. And I think that's sort of the line that we're trying to walk at the moment is yes, we understand that we still have a commercial um, obligation to our business, but also how do you then complement it with things like your social channels to have more one-to-one, -one, um, less commercial in-your-face conversations with your customers and provide extra uh, experiences on top of whatever you're doing. So for instance, on social media, we're now offering you know meditation tips and how do you stay calm in a period like this and how do you bring down your anxiety and really being really open with our customers around the fact that this is not going to be perfect period how do you as a customer want to be communicated with at this time yeah that's a really really good point rachel i think um anyone who's got that that messaging is is doing a really really good thing at the moment so uh phil right you guys um loyalty and email any anything you guys are doing in that space that worth noting um so i guess in line with our broader strategy you know we're sort of changed our messaging a little bit um but also really making sure we're staying on brand. So for us, you know, where it's about the language um, we're using, it's like we're trying to, I guess, stay re relevant in the current market, but you know, where we would be uh, generally somewhere where somebody would come for, you know, the expert advice on stationery um, and sort of some of that area, it's now, you know, how how do you keep your home space and your home office, um, you know, ma maintaining that work-life balance, um, sort of keeping sane in this time of the, the sort of world insanity. Um, so for us, it's really yeah, maintaining that. Um, we did uh, ramp up our communication levels a little bit. Um, and we're also, I guess, really moving so we've recently moved from mailchimp to dot digital so we're really in the early stages of that but we will sort of be ramping up a lot more of that um sort of personalized and um sort of i guess customer centric communication um and being a little bit a lot more targeted in how we approach that uh, going forward excellent well i think um Rosina, we got we're at the 10 minute mark away from wrapping up here. So I don't know if we wanted to dive into some of the questions that have been coming through. Um, I've got one here uh, from Karen Hanley for Phil, um, as far as how you're managing to keep sourcing products from international suppliers uh, with the lockdowns, any ways of getting around it? Um, you mentioned obviously looking at, at local suppliers potentially more, but is there any insight into how you can get product in at the moment? Um, that would really be more of our product team for to answer that. Um, look, we have, so we work with, I guess, brands mostly more than individual suppliers. Um, but um, so we've got those pre-existing relationships and agreements in place for those like products. Um, our biggest issue at the moment is around timeframes. Um, so just stuff takes longer. 
Um, so yeah, that's sort of where we're at. Um, I don't have any particular trips um, getting around lockdowns, um, but like most, like our stuff is, we've got con a container, right? Con a couple of containers arriving this week. Um, it's just all coming sea freight. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think, yeah, I've been hearing people are moving to, to sea freight more than you know, steering away from the high cost of air freight at the moment with our merchants for sure. Um, one question uh, we've got here, as far as like looking at um, future impact and future business and the eventual uh, return of, of retail stores, Rachel, um, any any plans on how you guys will um, get, uh, get back on deck and what sort of communication we'll have and what things will look like once we do start opening stores back up? Look, I think that's that's a little bit at the moment, just a bit of a, a magical question. I do yeah. think um, at the time, pretty much everything we do as a business at the moment to deal with this period is a bit of a double-edged sword, I would say. Um, you know, you need to be able to acclimatise to what the customer wants at the moment. So that's discount, discount, discount. But as a brand, you know, you can't just do things like throw away free returns and offer a discount on everything at every time because customers will then come to expect it when we come out of this period. And that is be, will be where we get a really slow ramp up from brands if we have spent this whole time just really pandering to this discount economy. I think what we do need to do as businesses, though, is understand that the world will be different after this. So where we have had, you know, certain shifts from online to in-store and, and the omni-channel experience has been weighted to traditional bricks and mortar, I think customers themselves are going to come out of this with a real um, technical acrimon that they probably didn't have before. So all the things that we're putting into place as a business right now, A, have to have a long-term strategy. So how do you make it sustainable? You know, how do you do things within your business now that are going to drive convenience for the for the customer without hitting your bottom line. Because when you come out of this, your bottom line will be smashed if you can't get out of the cycle of what you've just implemented. Um, but I think also from a technical acumen perspective, there's going to be so much agility and new innovation that comes out of this. Make sure it doesn't leave business practice and keep thinking about how to create it without compromising your business as a whole. And that's going to be the challenge for, I think, most vendors and the ones that come out of this most successful with the ones that are able to implement that technical understanding into their new daily business without necessarily having to, done it, having to do it at the detriment of the bottom line. Perfect. Good, good response there. And um, from Brian, uh, we've had a question come in in regards to virtual reality. Um, we've sort of um, touched a bit around how there's tools out there for sizing and, and that sort of stuff that you're utilising, TrueFit, Rachel, and uh, there's uh, similar products for, for the footwear category. Tristan, Shopify released the rich media stuff. Um, maybe either yourself or, or Merlin can see what you guys are seeing here and, um, yeah, how potentially we can utilise tools that exist. Well, I mean, firstly, we... we you know, announced those tools a year ago. Then in the middle of last year, we really started to roll them out. And the start of the year, you could kind of save those images into, uh, into you know, uh, your, your, your hosting with Shopify, um, which is really exciting. But, you know, it, it, it is, has been a really slow uptake of that. You know, like most people were trying it with a few different products to just see, you know, what the process would be, if they could, actually get the, the cost of, um, of shooting those products and getting their imaging down um, so that they could do, do it on volume, on mass. Um, so that's been difficult and, and, and I haven't seen that really kick up, but I imagine in this period is, I mean, at least we're ready for it, you know? So I, I wonder, Merlene, if you've actually seen any of your clients really decide that this is a, the, the future path for them. No, um, not yet, not yet, but I'm actually, and the reason why I'm smiling is, um, has everyone seen what Google's released in relation to um, 3D animals? Yes, I had a golden retriever the other day. <laughs> yeah, well, there's pandas, there's lions, there's alligators. And, what have they got? Um, Tell us, it. I'm not, I haven't seen it yet. What, what is it? Oh, so <laughs> you, if you type in lion in Google, type in line and then scroll down and then you'll see, um, do you want, there's a question, do you, do you want to see this line in 3D? Oh, yeah. um, it's almost like a, um, a Q&A &A box, I guess, that Google put in there and then you scan your room and then a line appears, a real line, a virtual real line appears and you can make it bigger and you can make it smaller. And anyway, my point around that is, and we've been having lots of fun at, um, with it in the house. Um, I have a four-year-old son um, and he has been, um, you know, just 
killing himself, um, I think, over it. But my, my point is more that I think what Google has done, and potentially Tristan, it'd be really interesting to have this conversation in a year's time, it, what Google has done is it's made virtual reality available to the masses. And um, I think that that usage, and normally there's a spark, there's a paradigm change. I think, you know, it's like, I think, you know, JD.com and SARS. And um, I think uh, this could be the paradigm change where um, virtual reality actually does become a part of people's everyday shopping behavior. So, you know, um, I'm looking at a lamp for our study and normally I would go to the store and, you know, size it up and have a think about it. But instead I can imagine, you know, just waving my phone um, over my desk and actually seeing that lamp appear and, you know, in situ. And I, I do think that we are going to see um, probably more, I'm not so sure so much about fashion um, at this stage, but I definitely, I think that in a raft of different um, verticals, I think homewares is a big one. We may see, um, VR become more ubiquitous. Yeah, absolutely. So I was just going to say, right, I think that's absolutely right. I mean, you know, putting a lamp on your desk to see how it works is kind of, you know, it's nice, but it's not enough if you just don't want a lamp at this stage. Mm -hmm. It's not enough to make you shop around looking for which products um, are available as a 3D image. You'd have to do a lot of searching. I mean, one of the good ones for us was a bicycle. A lot of people want to put that bike, um, you know, next to the, their current bike in their room and just see what that looks like. Uh, or they want to see if a pram will fit in the boot of their car. And, you know, we had some modelling for that. It looks really good. But you're right. It, it, it means it's not still in the common vernacular. So people aren't really using it day to day. I literally just put a lion on my desk. I'd never seen that before. And, uh, and I would, Do you love it? Yeah, I love it. I would go and play with my four-year-old boy as well and show him how to do that. And when he starts doing that every day, every minute, it's just going to be part of our natural kind of, you know, use of our mobile phones. And therefore, we'll want to do it with more products and people. Will. So it, it really does have to be that mass usage for it to, for the technology to then kick up to, to personal people using the products that we've already created. I think that might happen just with online shopping in general. I mean, you've got, I think we've now got millions of people who have never shopped a day in their life online who now are being forced online, even for everyday essentials. And I do, I do think that this is um, potentially the, um, the step change that the e-commerce, I think, industry needed to um, start to tip the scales, I think, more in um, online's favour as well. Fantastic. Well, um, we're approaching 11 o'clock very quickly here. So I um, wanted to, first of all, thank you, Merlene. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Phil, um, for being the panellists today. Uh, and thank you very much, Tristan, for hosting with, with myself. And obviously, uh, we'll, we'll look to hopefully get Rob back on deck soon. And um, thank you, Ristina, for, for helping us set all this up. Ristina, did you want to just let the guys know what the next steps are here and what they can expect? Sure, thanks. So um, for everybody that's been participating with us on chat, I've just dropped a link to join the Rocketeers of Retail Slack channel. We'd love to see you over there. Carry on the discussion. There's usually a lot of really cool things happening there. Information is being shared. Uh, we have recorded this webinar. It will be available to you by YouTube later on today, pending internet issues. Um, and we will also be sending through a email uh, to everybody who's attended today. So thank you very much, everybody. It's been great. And uh, we hope to see you really soon. Thanks, guys. Thanks, thanks so much. Good day. Happy Friday. Yay. Yay. <laughs>